going to speak from the point of view that I'm rooted in, which is coming from a white uh, middle class Afrikaner uh, Dutch Reformed Church for good background. I think if I speak from that point of view, you can see that it would clearly not be appropriate for me to start by saying or saying much about whether it is the time for people to forgive. I don't think it's, it's my place or people coming from my point of view to answer that question. But I think there might be another question, and it's a question that has been for me generated by this discussion around uh, parole for Eugene de Kock. And it's something for me about an experience that I've also had during the TRC, which has been affirmed uh, in a sad way since then. And that, I think, has to do with the fact that I think it's time, perhaps, for many people to begin to even think about asking for forgiveness. Um, so instead of speaking from the point of view of people who've been on the receiving end, I think I want to speak about people who've been on the responsible side in a complex way in our, in our conflict. And I want to start with an experience I had during the TRC uh, where I had a chance to meet Eugene de Kock. And I wanted to meet him um, because I was fascinated by this whole thing around him being described as prime evil. Um, and so what I found myself, and this wasn't sort of thought through, it wasn't uh, something I planned uh, in advance, but when I walked into that room to meet him, and obviously I was a bit cautious with, you know, with all the blood on his hands, but there was, a time, there was a part of me who wanted to, when I shook his hand, wanted to say to him, I am sorry for the way you are being treated. So in a sense, there was a part of me that wanted to ask him for forgiveness, because I felt that there was something deeply wrong about the way in which my community, and including myself, and the churches, and the cultural organizations, all these different people who he served, and who he believed he was serving, were not actually taking shared responsibility. So even at that time, I felt he should have received amnesty. That it wasn't right that somebody who, who, especially somebody who was willing to come up with detailed truth, especially somebody who was willing to show some willingness to engage with people who suffered at his hands, and in my second conversation was also willing to take some responsibility for doing something about it. Because that was my second question to him when I, get a, when I got another chance to meet him is, tell me a bit more about what you would do if you were to come out of prison. Are you willing to do something in addition to your willingness to meet with the victims of the people who you uh, uh, violated? And he talked at that point even, and this is in the mid-90s, about his willingness to get involved in demining. And he had lots of ideas about what he felt he wanted to do to make up to some degree for what he was involved in. And I know since then he's been on a real journey, and partly because of the very powerful and important relationship with Pumla in terms of his own humanization. Uh, and that, that's really what I want to just stop and, and talk and reflect a little bit on and just make, I suppose, two points. Uh, because to me, the, the reason why I felt I had to say sorry to him was because I felt there was a lack of shared responsibility being taken by people from within, especially the Afrikaner community. But I've been around the country quite a bit in the last 18 months or so and spoken to many people. And one of the strong themes coming out is this hunger for acknowledgement a need for especially white South Africans, beneficiaries, people in positions of privilege, to actually take some sense of, of creative shared responsibility. So the question I then obviously sit with is why do people find it so difficult? Why do I find it sometimes so difficult to accept shared responsibility, especially when you deal with grievous wrongdoing? And you talked about the scale of the apartheid system. You talk about a crime against humanity. So what does it mean to really enter into that space, to walk towards this idea of accepting shared responsibility in a creative way? And it seems to me one of the big problems is that we tend to legalize responsibility. So when we think about it, we say, okay, within the legal system, you're responsible if you caused something and if you intended to cause something. And we individualize it often in that way. So if you say, somebody like Eugene de Kock, okay, he needs to take responsibility for what he did, what does it mean for me, as a former supporter of that system, as an Afrikaner, as a National Party member, as a whatever, I can go on with that list, what does it mean for me to take shared responsibility? I didn't cause what he did, I didn't intend necessarily what he did. 
Then I think the thing that we tend to underestimate is the first part of that word, and that is the response in responsibility. And it seems to me, if you look at, at, at just the basic human phenomenon where, where somebody might cause somebody to, to be hurt, but the people who observe it, or the people who are present, depending on their response, they will either add insult to the injury, or they will actually help to heal some of that wound. And people talk about second wounding. And I'm fascinated by that notion that by my response, even if I was not causally responsible in the narrow sense of the word, or even if I didn't intend somebody to be grievously hurt, when I'm becoming aware of it, when I'm faced with the reality of another human being in pain, and I become indifferent, if I'm silent, if I ignore it, if I do not respond, it doesn't become a neutral interaction. I'm actually adding salt to the injury. I'm actually becoming responsible for second wounding. And I think that applies even to the younger generation today. It becomes more difficult as you remove yourself in time and space. But I think that notion of the significance of the response part in responsibility, I think, opens up a space for anybody who is confronted with the realities of people still suffering as a result of what happened 20 years ago. To actually say, what is the quality of my response? And depending on that response, you actually become responsible not only for what people did in the past, but also for what you're adding to the injuries and the suffering of people today. So that's a very weighty responsibility, which is not dependent on some kind of retrospective causality or intentionality. It's actually relational. It's about a sensitivity in the moment to what you're confronted with. And we know that the legacy is still with us. And instead of focusing and avoiding that response ability by focusing on the shortcomings of the current government or whatever, I think we need to talk more openly about what does it mean for us as, as beneficiaries, as previous supporters, as descendants of previous uh, uh, supporters of that system, and indirectly people like Eugene de Kock, what does it mean to respond with sensitivity and humility and humanity to the people who are still hungering and asking for that very basic emotional model acknowledgement. Um, so that's the first really important point I'd like to make in terms of the significance of what does it mean to take shared response ability. The second point I'd like to make is the second part of that word, response ability. And I think there's a, a, a strong cultural thing. I mean, I think the legal system influences it. But also there seems to be a cultural uh, resistance to taking responsibility. And I think some of it has to do with the way in which we somehow see responsibility as a burden, as something to, to avoid, as something that's difficult and painful to take on. And it's almost like response disability. Um, and that there is this kind of almost intuitive resistance and almost fear to engage and move into that space. And I think some of the challenge, and, and this is really where working with people like Pumla and many other black South Africans, where I have been deeply humbled and, and, and encouraged and liberated, as it were, in terms of my own sense of humanity, by taking responsibility, by being willing to take at least some time to be willing to listen and being willing to say, what can we do together to address these consequences? And only in small ways I've done that, but in a disproportionate way. What I've been met with was, was a warmth of humanity and a generosity of spirit, which is deeply humbling and deeply encouraging. And if, once you've had that experience, you cannot look at responsibility with this burdened eye. It's actually the opposite. It's actually, ironically, I think the key, one of the keys to the liberation of white and Afrikaner and South Africans. So what we're avoiding in fact, is actually is tragic. Because by entering into that space and saying, yes, I was a supporter, or yes, I am a beneficiary in so many different ways. Yes, I have privileges, I have power, I have so many things I can do to take responsibility. It's not only a selfless altruistic act. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the reality of Ubuntu, really, in practice, where your humanity is tied up in that relational acceptance of having to do something, to show compassion, empathy, and engage, and take responsibility. And then it becomes an ability. And that's really what the tragedy for me is about what is going on in South Africa, is that people seem to be avoiding and withdrawing 
and, and scapegoating and denying all these kind of negative responses. And if we can just find a way of transforming that, we actually, by going into that space, our own humanity and our own liberation is, is, is tied up in that. And I don't think there's any other way, really, for us to come to a point of sustainable peace. And perhaps if more of us, and I'm talking about white Africans speaking South Africans, actually go on that journey, we will be amazed by that spirit of, of generosity, but even the spirit of forgiveness that I've encountered as well. But then at least it's something that, that is offered. It's not something that we're asking, and it's not something that we become impatient about because it's 20 years down the line. Thank you very much.